So you've been building out your home lab and you have a lot of virtual machines. Some of them are running Windows, some are running Linux, and some have a UI and some don't. And you find yourself remoting into those virtual machines quite a bit. And that means using a collection of tools like RDP, SSH, and VNC. And it can be a challenge to manage all of those tools across all of your devices. But what if you had one place you can go to to manage all those connections? Something that didn't require anything but a browser and didn't require any plugins. And you can do it all securely. Well, setting up a self-hosted remote access gateway is what we're gonna talk about today. Hey, welcome back. So I'm Techno Tim, and today we're gonna talk about Apache Guacamole, a clientless remote access gateway for all of your virtual machines. As a quick reminder, I stream every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, so if you wanna continue the conversation about guacamole there, we can. So let's talk about Apache Guacamole. So you've spun up a lot of virtual machines. Some of them are Windows servers or Windows desktops, and some of them are Linux servers or Linux desktops. And because these are all virtual machines, they're all running headless, which means there's no physical monitor attached to them. So the way that you access these is by remote access. It's up to you to remember, track, and use the appropriate tool for that virtual machine. And you've figured out a system on your main machine. You probably have a VNC client installed, an SSH client, and a remote desktop client. And that all works great until you move to another machine. And now you have to set up and configure those three things again. And if that next machine is a mobile device, now you have to figure out less familiar tools to set this up with. And you have to do this again and again for every new device you set up or every new platform you adopt. Well, that's where something like Apache Guacamole comes in. So Apache Guacamole is a clientless remote desktop gateway. It's clientless because it uses standard protocols like RDP, VNC, and SSH. And those protocols are already supported by operating systems that you're using. So you aren't required to install any additional software. And it works within any browser without any additional plugins. It also gives you an easy way to manage all of these connections. And on top of that, there are a lot of authentication options. It even supports things like one-time passwords or two-factor auth. And that's exactly what we're gonna talk about today. So today, in this video, we're gonna set up guacamole. And we're not gonna set up guacamole in the traditional way. We're gonna set up guacamole using Docker. And after Docker, we'll move on to something called Rancher. So if you aren't familiar with Rancher, Rancher is an easy way to spin up Kubernetes, which then gives you Docker. And if you need help setting that up, I've got a tutorial that'll help you set up Docker, Rancher, and Kubernetes in just a couple of minutes. But if you're using something else like Portainer, Open Media Vault, QNAP, Synology, or just plain old Docker, We'll cover that too. Then you'll have a self-hosted version of guacamole in just a couple of minutes. So with that out of the way, let's get started. The first thing you wanna do is go out to onzu slash docker guacamole on GitHub. Now, if you're subscribed to the channel, you know that I typically recommend Linux server.io images. However, the one that's on Linux server only supports the back end piece and we want the front end as well. I'm choosing this Docker image because it supports setting up the front end, the back end, as well as the database, which makes this much easier to implement. So let's scroll down and take a look at the Docker commands. And we can see here in the usage, there's very few things to configure. And so if we're running plain old Docker, we can run Docker run, then we're gonna choose our ports that we expose it on or publish, then we're gonna mount a volume, which is a path to our config on the local machine to the images config. And after that, we're gonna specify the Docker image. But we can see here under parameters, it also supports an environment variable. This environment variable is called extensions. And when we use this extensions environment variable, we can turn on different authentication methods. We can see it supports LDAP, Duo, Header, CAS, OpenID, two-factor auth, and Quick Connect. And you can see in their example, if you wanted to support LDAP plus Duo, you would just add them like this. Extensions equal auth dash LDAP comma auth dash Duo. And if we wanted to spin this up with plain old Docker, we could run this Docker command. And this would spin up Apache Guacamole on port 8080, pointing to our config, with a couple of extensions for authentication. And within a couple of minutes, we'd have it running. But we're gonna move on to Rancher. Now, keep in mind, if you're not using Rancher and you're using something like Portainer, QNAP, Synology, or Open Media Vault, they have very similar UIs and following this process will work as well. But in Rancher, we're going to go to Cluster, Default Cluster, and here we're gonna deploy a new workload. Let's name this workload Guacamole. Then we'll set the image to Onzu Guacamole. We can keep our namespace as default and for port mapping, I'm going to choose host port. And what this will do is publish the container port 80 to the host port of 80. 
8080 is a common port, so if you need to change this, you can. So I'm gonna change mine to 9600, but any port you have free will work. Now I did mention that it supports environment variables, and we'll set one up for two-factor authentication. However, we wanna make sure that this works first before we turn on two-factor auth. So we'll come back to that. And now we'll jump down to volume. So let's add a volume. Here I'm gonna use buy mount, a directory from a node, but if you have your storage set up another way, feel free to choose that. Here I'm going to name my volume guacamole, and here we'll need to specify the path on our node. Now, we haven't set up this folder yet, so let's do that. So you want to remote into your server and actually create a folder for it. So you want to create a folder on your node, and then copy that path to your clipboard. Mine slash home slash techno tim slash guacamole. And we'll paste that in there. And then the mount point is just slash config. The next thing we'll need to do is change our scaling and upgrade policy. Now, if you're using host port, typically I use kill all pods and start new. Then we can launch our container. And here we should see it spinning up and it's already running. Okay, let's take a look at the UI and we can see our UI is running. So the default username and password is guacadmin. So let's sign in. Once we sign in, we'll see all connections. Now, this is brand new, so we don't have any. But before we do that, let's change our password. So we'll go to this menu and go to settings. Then we'll go to preferences. Here you should probably set your language and time zone. Then we'll update our password. Another thing we'll do is create a new account and then disable this Guac Admin account. So the simplest way to do this is to clone this user. So let's go into Guac Admin, scroll down, let's click clone, and then let's change our username and give it a password. In here, we can configure more profile information. Here we can also set up account restrictions. This is handy if you want to give someone else access to Guacamole. Now these restrictions only apply to the Guacamole dashboard and not to the remote connections we'll set up here in a little bit. But if you wanted to create a user that could access your Guacamole dashboard outside of yourself, you could do that here. But anyways, let's finish cloning this user. Click save. Okay, so we have our new account. Let's actually sign in with our new account. So let's sign out and we'll sign in with our new one. And then let's go back into users and actually delete that Guac Admin account. Users, Guac Admin, and delete. Okay, so we have our admin user, that's ourself. Now let's create a connection. So we'll go into connection, and here we can set up a new connection or a new group. If we wanted to create a new group, we would obviously just click new group. And here we could give it a group name. Now this is up to you on how you wanna organize your connections. You could do it by role, by operating system, or anything else you can think of. But I'm just gonna call this one Windows. Then we'll save, and now let's create a new connection. Click new connection. Okay, so this is our new connection form. The very first thing you wanna do is change our protocol. Don't fill out any of this until you change your protocol. So we can change it here. So on Windows, we're going to use RDP for the protocol. And here, you can set up some of the same restrictions that we had within the group, like concurrency limits, load balancing, and other parameters. But let's just get connected to this Windows machine first. So we'll scroll down to network and go to hostname. Here you can put in the host name of the device or the IP address. I'm going to use IP address. Next, we'll want to choose the port. The default port for RDP is 3389. Next, we'll want to fill up authentication. So this is going to be the Windows user on that machine that can actually sign in remotely. Next, you'll fill out a password. Then you'll fill out the domain. If you don't have a domain, you don't need to fill this out. And our security mode is gonna be NLA or network level authentication. And next, we'll need to ignore server certificate errors. And this is a recommendation from Guacamole. Now, we won't need to fill out anything for remote desktop gateway, and we don't need to do anything for basic settings either. In the display section, you can tweak a few things here. The two things I typically change are the color depth. I usually set it to 32-bit. Now, this is gonna use more bandwidth and you can lower it if you'd like, but 32-bit looks really crisp and clean. And next is the resize method. I typically choose display update virtual channel something. <laughs> but what this means is it'll dynamically update the resolution as you rescale your browser. So choose display update virtual channel RDP 8.1 it's a mouthful. And next we'll see some parameters that we see on the typical RDP client. We can choose whether or not we want to disable the clipboard. We can choose audio, printing, drive mapping, file upload and download, and you name it. And these are all things you typically see in your RDP client. Next are some performance options. And these will really be up to you. But you can choose whether or not to enable wallpaper, theming, clear type fonts, which I typically turn on. So full window drag, that's the preview as you're dragging the window. Desktop composition, so this is glass or arrow effects. Menu animations, bitmap caching, off-screen caching, and glyph caching. 
Now, you'll want to tweak this based on your preferences, but I typically only turn on clear type font. Next, we can configure some options for remote app, then some Hyper-V options, load balancing, and then screen recording. So this is really cool. You can actually record this screen as you're remoting into it. Now, I don't do this, but I can definitely understand the use case for this, especially if you have other people using this system. So choose that if you like. Then you have secure FTP, and you can configure this if you like. And then last but not least, we have wake on LAN. So if your device supports wake on LAN, or your hypervisor supports sending a wake on LAN packet to a virtual machine, you could actually keep this virtual machine off all the time, and then send the wake on LAN packet to wake it up and then remote into it. So if you're using this for a desktop in the cloud, you can actually keep that desktop off until you want it on and you remote in through Guacamole. But you'll want to be sure that the physical device or the virtual machine supports wake on LAN packets, but a very cool option. Okay, let's save this. Oh yeah, we forgot to name the connection. Okay, so we're gonna name this connection. I'm gonna name this Windows 10 VM, real creative, I know. And then we can choose our location. So let's group this in the Windows group we created. And now let's save it. Save. Okay, so now in connections, we can actually see our group. And within our group, we can see our new virtual machine. So let's try to remote into our virtual machine. So keep in mind, we're in the connection management screen. So we'll need to actually go back here and go to home. And now we can see our connections. And here's our Windows group and here's our Windows 10 VM. So let's click on it. Here we go. And we're remoted in. And this is all done over HTML. We can open folders, browse the web with Edge if you want, open up PowerShell for remote administration. So all the things you could normally do through RDP. Now I'm in full screen mode, so we can restore this down. And you can see here, I'm going through a web browser and this should be responsive. So as we resize this, the client desktop resizes as well. So this is really awesome. We're able to remote into our machine over a web page. So really quick, something I didn't mention is that RDP should be turned on. If you're having troubles RDPing into your Windows machine, you wanna go into settings. Here, I typically just type remote desktop settings and then choose that option. You wanna make sure that remote desktop is turned on and then you'll wanna select users and make sure that your user account has remote access. And that's how simple it is to RDP into a Windows machine. Okay, so next up is a Linux machine. Now, I should just say that this should be any machine that has SSH and not just Linux. So let's configure an SSH connection. So we'll go into settings and we'll go into connections and let's create a new group since we have one for Windows. I'm gonna call this Linux and it'll be in the root location and we'll hit save. Okay, so now let's add a new connection. So this is called Ubuntu server and we're gonna put it in the Linux group and let's change the protocol to SSH. As soon as we change that, we see some options open up down here. So the host name needs to be something it can resolve, but I'm gonna use an IP address. Next, the port for SSH is 22. If you use something else, change it here. If you have a public host key, you'll need to fill this in here. Then we'll fill out the authentication section. So if you only use username and password, you can fill that out. But if you supply a private key and a passphrase, you can fill that out too. So now our remote connection is going to be a terminal and we have some terminal options. We can choose our color scheme. We can choose black on white, gray on black, green on black, white on black, or a custom theme. Then you can configure fonts, your font size, maximum scroll back size, and make it read only which is handy if you want someone to only be able to see the output. And so I'm not gonna configure any of this, but feel free to tweak it if you'd like. And then we have all of the same options we saw when we configure a Windows device. So let's save this. And now we have our new connection. We can see under Linux, we have our Ubuntu server connection. And so let's remote into this. So let's go back home. On our connections dashboard, we now see this. So let's remote in. And here we go. We're SSH'd into our server through a web browser. We can do all of the normal stuff we would do in a terminal. And you can see here that this is in a web browser. However, I have it in full screen mode. And you can see that this is kind of a little responsive too. So it doesn't dynamically resize what's already there, but it does set the max width after it's there, which is good enough for me. Okay, so let's log out of here, go back home. Next, let's configure a Linux desktop. Now we have a lot of options for a Linux desktop remote connection. Our Linux desktop supports lots of protocols. You can actually use RDP if you like, 
SSH, or even VNC. So let's turn on remote access in our Linux desktop. So I'm using Ubuntu here, but you can use any version of Linux you like. So once we're in Ubuntu, let's go into settings, then we'll go into sharing, then we'll toggle sharing on, then let's turn on screen sharing. We'll want to require a password here, and then we'll turn it on for the network we're connected to. Okay, let's close out of here. And so this is going to turn on the VNC connection to this Ubuntu desktop. Now let's configure that connection inside of Guacamole. So we'll go into settings, connections, and let's create a new connection. Let's name this Ubuntu desktop. Let's put the location within our Linux. Let's choose the Linux folder and we'll keep the protocol as VNC. For our host name, we'll just put in the IP address and the default VNC port is 5900. Then we'll fill in our username and password and then we'll save. Then we'll go back to home and we should see our desktop under here. And so let's connect. And here we go, we're connected to our Linux desktop and you can see it's within a browser. And this scales pretty good too. And we can do all the normal things we would from a remote client. Okay, so, so far we've set up Guacamole, we created a new admin account, we deleted the default admin account, we set up an RDP connection to a Windows machine, we set up an SSH connection to a Linux server, we set up a VNC connection to a Linux desktop, but now let's configure two-factor auth for this. So I purposely didn't set up two-factor auth yet because I wanted to make sure all of this worked and I didn't want to confuse the matter with two-factor auth in the very beginning. But it's really easy to add. So we'll need to add one more environment variable. So let's go into our guacamole workload and let's click edit, expand environment variables, and let's add a variable. Here we'll want to add the environment variable extensions and then the value of auth totp. And this is for the two-factor auth extension. Okay, so let's save that. It's going to redeploy this workload and it should come back online. Okay, so let's go back to guacamole now. So let's sign in using that admin account. Okay, so immediately upon logging in, we get a two-factor auth prompt. So this is really awesome. We can use something like Authy or Google Authenticator to scan this barcode and retrieve our code. So let's do that. Okay, let's add an account. Let's scan this QR code. save our account. Okay, so let's type in our code. So this is awesome. Now we have two-factor authentication with Guacamole. And if we sign out and sign back in, now we're required to provide this authentication code. And now we can sign in securely. And so now that we can sign in securely, there's one more thing we should talk about. And that's actually hosting this securely. So as you can see, Guacamole itself doesn't come with a certificate. That means that our communication is not encrypted which also means you shouldn't host this publicly unless you have a certificate. If you're going to access this, you should access it with a certificate. And if you're going to access this from the outside, you should definitely use a VPN connection. That will ensure that you have a secure tunnel between you on the go and your server infrastructure. But even then, you should still use a certificate. And if you'd like to host this securely over SSL within your Rancher cluster, I have a tutorial on how to set this up using Rancher. This tutorial walks you through getting an SSL certificate using Let's Encrypt, and then it uses traffic as your load balancer to route that traffic internally. That will help you get a certificate and host this securely. Then you can access this from anywhere in the world using any device over SSL with two-factor auth, which seems like a pretty robust solution to me. So what do you think of Guacamole? What do you think of setting up a remote access gateway? What are some of the systems that you need remote access to where this would help? I'd love to hear your answers in the comments section below. And while you're down there, don't forget to give this video a like and consider subscribing if you haven't already. And if you have more questions, you can always join my live stream. I stream every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, so if you have a question about this video or any of my other videos, hop in my stream and I'd love to have you. So, thanks so much for watching and till next time. Stream on, my friends. Uh, storage solution with lots of options. And I think those options now, instead of jails on BSD, uh, will be Docker containers. I could even see them going as far as, I have all these ideas, and I'm gonna say, like, remind me in six months to see if I was right. I'm gonna make some big bets. Here's my big bets on, on TrueNAS scale. Uh, obviously, Linux, uh, Docker support. I think it's gonna have first-class Kubernetes support. I think they're just gonna say, yep, you can spin up a Kubernetes cluster right on this thing. I think they're gonna make it easy, right? They see things like Portainer, they see things like Rancher, um, and then they see stuff like like um, like uh, uh, Proxmox, right? And they look at the solutions that people are choosing because they give them a lot of options. So I, I do think, I think we're gonna see a combination of, of Proxmox 
plus Trunaz. It's gonna be like Proxmox, Trunaz, and Rancher all had a baby. That's my that's my uh that's my guess.